Good evening, everyone. I'm Gabby Wood. I'm the Chief Executive of the Booker Prize Foundation. And I'm here really to introduce Alex Clark, who will be introducing the other guests, and to say a little bit about Hilary Mantel and the Booker Prize, which, as I'm sure you know, she won twice. Um, we're delighted to be working with John Murray on this new collection of Hillary's journalism. It's a wonderful book edited by Nicholas Pearson, her longtime editor at Fourth Estate, who would have been here with us tonight, but unfortunately has COVID. And I know, when I, when I say we're delighted to be working, really I mean that they've done all the work. <laughs> but you can read a wonderful piece by Nicholas on the Booker Prize's website, as well as an extract from this book. So please do go and have a look at that if you have a moment. Um, I hesitated over whether to tell this story, but since there aren't too many of you, I think it's okay. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead. I first met Hillary in, I think it was 1998, when we both had books out. My book was this big and very few pages long, and her book was about the giant O'Brien. Perhaps some of you will remember that novel. And because um, my book was about a midget skeleton that was displayed in the Hunterian Museum next to the giant O'Brien skeleton at the time, we had been put on a stage together at the Brighton Festival. So we were due to speak together, and this was, of course, uh, at that point, the honour of my life. And I set off for Brighton with a friend who had very generously offered me a lift, and we got stuck in traffic and didn't get to the event until it was more or less over. Uh, and so the, uh, the, the good news for the audience was that they got 100% Hillary as, <laughs> as an event. And the good news for me was that she was nice to me for really no good reason ever afterwards. And I, I bumped into her at, at various points and also interviewed her when I was writing about her books and then came to work with her as, uh, in my capacity at the Booker Prize and to see her then. She was very funny about prizes, in particular about the Booker Prize, what it meant to win. Uh, you perhaps would have read this, but when she, she won, she wrote about it and she said, you know, some people say, pious people say there's a right time to win this prize and there's a right book to win it for, but actually that's rubbish. Uh, and that when she won, she thought, you just have to win it right now. <laughs> Hand it over. It's been long enough. <laughs> While my Booker Prize colleagues and I feel privileged, of course, to have read and known and laughed with Hillary, the Booker Prize was not, and I know this is obvious, but I'm going to say it, it was not what made her great. Her books, all of them, had and continue to have a heartbeat of their own. I said this to Patrick Hargadon when her last novel was not shortlisted, it was longlisted for the Booker and not shortlisted and we were all quite shocked and we sort of had a moment over that, the idea that, it would, that its heart would go on beating and really prizes had nothing to do with it. Now, Alex, as I said, will introduce the others but I do want to tell you a tiny bit about Alex herself. Uh, <laughs> she's making faces, of course. She's, she's an extraordinary critic and an extraordinary reader and I've seen her in conversation with Hillary in the past, not only did they generate enormous warmth together, but they were well matched for perceptiveness and mischief. You'll get to see a bit of that, or at least half of that, yourselves in a minute. But before you do, we're going to show you a clip from the documentary, Return to Wolf Hall. Enjoy your evening. When my first book came out, a very famous writer wrote to my publisher and said um, who is this young woman that made me laugh when World Four came out people said how wonderful to have so much success so late in life actually um, World Four was my 12th book and I started writing when I was 22 I first published when I was 35. I breathed in stories as soon as I breathed in air. I, sometimes I think I wasn't born, but I just came out of an ink blot. while everyone's sitting down, 
um, tell you a little bit about, about aspects of Hillary that, that, um, that I knew. I, I didn't know her well, and I wouldn't... For God's sake. So sorry, so sorry. We literally talked about this. <laughs> Add. It's awesome. Now, everybody, everybody comfy? Yes. Um, I keep thinking when things happen that that would have made Hillary laugh. It would have made her laugh, actually. Um, I wouldn't for a minute say that, that um, I was a friend to Hillary, but I was very friendly with her, and our paths crossed a lot over the years in interviews and on stages, and occasionally... Uh, Privately, and I had hoped that they would cross a lot more because I live in Ireland and she was about to move to Ireland and we talked a lot about the things that we yeah. might be fun to explore there. But I have to say, the time that we flew to Russia on a, a, a shady sort of a slightly unexplained cultural mission <laughs> that we all suspected we might be the sort of cultural fig leaf to something special going on. <laughs> uh, but we didn't think about that for too long because we lost our luggage on the way. And when we said, oh, look, we really do need a, some things, we got taken to a sort of indoor market. This was not sophisticated Moscow at all. Um, it was quite remote. And we said, well, we must at very least get some knickers. Uh, and we were taken to a store where a man just held up these huge knickers for both of us all. And now, I told this story a lot of times. And I said to her once, I'm, I'm really sorry, I do keep telling that story and you're actually getting famouser and famouser and perhaps I shouldn't. And she said, Alex, I've dined out on it for years. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, the, the coda to that is that our luggage arrived on the plane that was taking us out the next day. But that is, so it is. Um, we are going to begin oh. with, not yet, oh, I've yeah. introduced okay. you. Oh. <laughs> we are going to begin when I've introduced my guests. I've, of course, got the amazing novelist Sarah Perry, wonderful Oscar Pierce and Lydia Leonard, actors in Wolf Hall, and Jeremy Herrin, the director of the RSC uh, Productions. Thank you so much all for joining us. Now, Oscar, my it is your moment. Okay, go on, go on <laughs> May you okay. read us uh, a little bit. Of okay. Time. Thank you so much. Just got to yeah, hear my own voice th through the microphone and hope I don't blow the speakers. <laughs> Across the Narrow Sea, Putney, 1500. So now get up! Felled, dazed, silent, he has fallen, not full length on the cobbles of the yard. His head turned sideways. His eyes are turned out towards the gate as if someone might arrive to help him out. One blow, properly placed, could kill him now. Blood from the gash on his head, which was his father's first effort, is trickling across his face. Add to this, his left eye is blinded, but if he squints sideways with his right eye, he can see that the stitching of his father's boot is unravelling. The twine has sprung clear of the leather, and a hard knot in it has caught his eyebrow and opened another cut. So, now get up! Walter is roaring down at him, working out where to kick him next. He lifts his head an inch or two and moves forward on his belly, trying to do so without exposing his hand, which Walter enjoys stamping. What are you? An eel, his parent asks. He trots backwards, ga gathers pace, and aims another kick. It knocks the last breath out of him. He thinks it may be his last. His forehead returns to the ground, and he lies waiting for Walter to jump on him. The dog, Bella, is barking, shut away, shut away in an outhouse. I'll miss my dog, he thinks. The yard smells of beer and blood. Someone is shouting down on the riverbank. Nothing hurts, or perhaps it's that everything hurts, because there's no separate pain he can pick out. But the cold strikes him, just in one place, just through his cheekbone as it rests on the cobbles. Look now, look now, Walter bellows. He hops on one foot as if he's dancing. Look what I've done, burst my boot, kicking your head. 
inch by inch, inch by inch forward. Never mind what he calls you, an eel or a worm or a snake, head down. Don't provoke him. His nose is clotted with blood and he has to open his mouth to breathe. His father's momentary distraction at the loss of his good boot allows him the leisure to vomit. Oh yeah, that's right, Walter yells. Spew everywhere. Spew everywhere on my cobbles. Come on, boy, get up. Let's see you get up by the blood of creeping Christ. Stand on your feet. Creeping Christ, he thinks. What does he mean? His head turns sideways. His hair rests on his own vomit. The dog barks, Walter roars, and bells peal out across the street. He feels a sensation of movement, as if the filthy ground has become the Thames. It gives and sways beneath him. He lets out his breath. One great final gasp. You've done it this time, a voice tells Walter. But he closes his ears, or God closes them for him. And he is pulled downstream on a deep black tide. much that really I mean that amazing opening to what was going to be a project that went on for many many years um, I'm going to talk to Sarah a bit about historical fiction now but I, please do all jump in whenever <laughs> you wish we're going to make this as, as a round table of conversation as we can um, but Sarah I mean I suppose one of the things to start with is just this vexed endless business of what historical fiction <laughs> is I know um, you have written it, I suppose, although you might say you've never written it. That's not what your novels are. And Hilary, I wonder, was she the same? Did you talk about it? We, um, she attended an event um, that I was speaking at because she had a literary festival in Budley Salterton. I don't know why that name is funny, but it always <laughs> makes me smile. Um, and I was um, talking about Melmoth, my third novel, which has some historical components to it. And I remember seeing her in the audience and feeling sort of, you know, like the Pope had turned up at a christening. <laughs> and um, while she was there, I remembered something that she had said about historical fiction and mentioned it on stage, which is that all fiction is historical fiction. If I were to write a contemporary novel, um, you know, go home and start tonight with what the traffic was like outside the British Library, by the time it had been written and rewritten and edited and proofread and published, it would already be dated. And I think the question of what constitutes historical fiction is political, right? Because it tends to be ladies' fiction that is categorised mm -hmm. as historical fiction. Women novelists who are called historical novelists. It gives it a sense of kind of dustiness, of lack of moral rigour, lack of um, sort of um, essential speaking to the time. And I think what these books have demonstrated is that they are not about the past, they are about now, they are about power and avarice and striving and nobility and lack of. Um, and her books, of, of all books, really kind of defy the need to even have a category of historical fiction because they're so above and beyond and underneath that. Mm -hmm. And not just, not just these among her novels either. No, I mean, certainly. Gabby was mentioning The Giant O'Brien, yeah. which has, is so interesting on the relationship between this country and Ireland. Yeah. Um, she talks in many pieces in this collection of her own vexed relationship with Englishness and with Irishness. Um, but of course, her first novel, the first novel that she wrote, Place of Greater Safety, which was not her first novel no. published <laughs> for this very reason, yes, right? Because yeah. she couldn't find a publisher who thought people would want to read that kind of thing. Yeah. And it turned out they did. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, one of my favourite of her books is Flood, which is kind of the connoisseur's Hilary Mantel novel. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and that's set in the 50s. And it's a gothic novel. It's a novel about religion. It's a mini horror novel. It's very funny. Um, and it's, there's, there's a sense that uh, she writes in Mantel time that all of her novels, wherever they're set, are specific to her view of the world, her 
construction of it through language and through imagery, uh, she sort of moves like a kind of untime-bound character through history. Um, and I, I kind of bristle when I'm referred to as a historical novelist, when Hilary Mantel is referred to one, I sort of draw out my knives because mm -hmm. it, it just cannot speak to the, the breadth and the rigour of the books. But she did say um, repeatedly and vociferously, didn't she, that people who lived in times particularly long ago were not just us in old clothes. Yes. She was conscious that there was a difference between writing about the now that we actually have a living memory of and somewhere where we don't. Absolutely. And that was really very, very important to her, wasn't it? Yeah, particularly when it came to religion, because she, she was very assertive about the fact that Wolf Hall, uh, the whole trilogy, cannot work unless the reader really believes that the question of the immortal soul is a kind of daily struggle for the characters, that this is not a, a kind of um, framework where you give lip service to the church and, and you know, you might not eat meat on Fridays, but it w they really did believe in a, in a, in a literal heaven, heaven and hell to sort of certain extents. The church really did have that power. But I think what she shows is that they are specific and universal to exactly the same degree. Because while we do not necessarily, in a secular age, have precisely those essential worldviews, we do have others. So they function of kind of proxies for what drive us. It may mm. not be religious faith in a kind of post-Reformation um, tussle of the conscience, but we still have it. So they are very specific, but they're also, they have that universal quality, I think. She was quite amazing to talk to about religion and about faith, because you would get quite a long way through a conversation, and then she'd say something like, but it's all metaphor, and that would be it, and of course it was. I just wonder, bringing the, the others in, before we sort of talk more uh, about um, the, the staging and the adaptations, but that idea, we always talk about historical fiction in terms of, of novels and, and written, the written word, but I don't know how it feels to directors and actors, whether you think, okay, how do we embody something which is the past, but still we're embodying it with our present selves? I, can I say what I was saying earlier? Because I've remembered what it was. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> We were, we were all having chats earlier, and I've got to say the thing. That, and I was running around saying, save it for the stage. Um, so, yeah, I, I, for, certainly for, for these play, the two that I was in, uh, the, the, everything happens in the present on the stage. It necessarily has to happen in the now. So even though you're wearing, and this is the case with Shakespeare as well, that you're kind of wearing these old costumes, that everything happens in the present. And that's what's very clear with Hillary's work, including the place of great, great safety as well, is that everything happens in the now. And I think that translates itself very much to when you're doing a play, because you have to, you're never talking about, the, I mean, you talk about a backstory, but when you're playing the scene, the scene happens in the present, in the now. That's it. <laughs> felt much better when I said it earlier. <laughs> You've got it out there, you said it. <laughs> yeah, but that's great what you were saying, Sarah, because I remember having similar conversations with Hillary at the start of the, the whole journey about, you know, trying to blow the dust off the characters and find out what made them contemporary and what made them resonate now. And the thing about, you know, the, the very, the reality of hell was something that really was very instructive and very, very helpful. And all sorts of sort of other cultural things that she was just great about, that she was, I remember having a really interesting conversation about, um, British culture and what we would imagine British culture to be in the Tudor period. Uh, and she describes it as much more of a sort of European um, thing, that, that people were in their bodies much more than a kind of post-Victorian British male would be, that the men were sporty and very um, touchy-feely. And there was a sort of... So all of those things were just, were just great examples of her stripping away layers and layers of inappropriately applied history to get to the real people. And I think it's fantastic that she zoned in on a character who had been there all along and everyone had misunderstood. Or at least that's how we feel about it now, because we feel that the precision of her character work on Cromwell is just so authoritative that that must be how <laughs> Cromwell was. Yes. And that he was there all along in the background of uh, a single 
Holbein portrait, and she was the person that really understood. He was at the centre of all of these ideas. Mm. Um, and so far from becoming a historical piece of um, theatricalia in Stratford, it did feel like a very present, transactional bit of politics on stage. Yeah. I mean, Anne Boleyn is someone we think we know mm. so well. Um, and I found it interesting, you know, reading this book again, just as saying, you know, we, we do think just because of the way that things have been presented to us that everybody's teeth were falling out. Yeah. And, and they just weren't. And mm. actually, they lived a completely different life. Did, when, in your portrayal, mm. did you, how did you yeah. find <clears throat> Anne? It was, it was a, a, an extraordinary and uh, wonderful and the privilege of my career to, well, working with Hillary and p playing Anne, a woman with such sort of potent uh, symbols, for, you know, reimagined by different generations. And, yeah, going back to it, uh, we, we very much became, it sounds a bit loveyish, but l like a family. And there obviously are real people and it's history. And it did feel with the, the, it took us over, I think, in a quite a ghosty way. They were very present and live. We had Hillary there to ask, it was such a wealth of information to ask any little details about anything. And so, and also consequently, the, the actors, we subconsciously started treating each other like mm. the characters. So it was, it's quite nice in, yeah. until it wasn't nice to playing Amberlynn. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 imagine it was good, 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 good yeah, and then bad. bad. Really yeah. bad. Yeah. But um, it, yeah, it was also, but that was so accurate that she, she was incredibly present during the rehearsals and, and during the production. She was really a part of the story. And so, and she was writing Mirror in the Light as we were w working in the, in the West End. And obviously it did, the shows did very well and that helped, but she was, it was always, she, she kind of gave us help with the, with the characters. So we kind of became the characters from the book. And so when the Mirror in the Light came out some year, you know, when was it? Two, three years ago, mm. two years. Anyway, it was a long, long break from us finishing the, sh the show before it was uh, published. And it felt like, when reading it, it felt like being backstage. It felt like the characters that she'd written were influenced by our performances. And they were kind of an extension of the work that we'd done on the plays. It was, did you find that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Pierre, uh, uh, the um, Christophe. Of course, she, you're not, yeah, yeah. She, did, she told Pierre that yeah. she'd added some, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But she said that, that she'd added and was, in fact, like some of the characters in The Mirror of the Light were named after some of the actors that were playing small and sort of unnamed okay. parts in uh, Will Fall and Bring Up wow, the Bodies. I didn't know like that. Bastings, the boatman, Basting, I don't know if yeah. you remember him, was um, yes. Ben Hastings, who we call Bastings, so as not to confuse him with <laughs> ben, ben Miles. Ben. And then Bastings <laughs> is now immortalised. <laughs> wow. Because he was such a great... He was just great as the boatman. Yeah. And uh, Hillary created the character. Sarah, I wanted to ask you, before we have another reading, Lydia's going to read a, a bit from the book about this business of adaptation. But I wanted to, to ask you about the novels, watching them come along over this period, both how you felt as a reader and, and as another writer, as a writer to whom they clearly spoke. It, it's really hard to articulate their significance without sounding extraordinarily hubristic and pretentious. Because I, what I want to say is that she was, throughout my, the 10 years of my publishing career to date, been a kind of touchstone in, in moments of, of real distress, uh, physical distress and professional distress and psychic distress. Something would appear in print almost supernaturally, and those of us who've met her in person will testify there was something otherworldly about mm. her physical presence, almost fairy-like. She mm. was very short, and her skin was very silken. Mm. And I remember when I met her and she kissed me, and her cheek was like a silk scarf mm. because her skin was so frail and fine. And so she appeared to me as this kind of... Um, almost like mischievously half demon, half angel presence. And so when I endured a period of intense physical pain, I came across Ink in the Blood, her mm. essay on suffering. And when I was really struggling with the fact that my writing is, I'm laughing, it's not actually that funny to me, but my writing is, is, is very old fashioned. And I had, my first book had had 
I was rejected by every publisher in England um, as being too odd and, and too old-fashioned. And at a moment when I felt the one thing that I ever wanted to do with my life, I couldn't do. I wasn't good enough. And I read um, Beyond Black mm. um, and understood that there is a way of speaking about wickedness and speaking about other worlds beyond what we perceive in a way that is intelligent and mischievous and questioning and funny and dark. And that although I could never possibly attain the skill that, that she has, at least there was a model for it. And until that moment, I'd been just terribly lonely. Mm. And actually the first um, piece of fan mail that I've ever written, first and last fan letter I've ever written, was when I was, I was doing a job, uh, I, c I couldn't get published, you know, nobody wanted me, I had a proper job, um, and was reading Giving Up the Ghost, and locked myself into the lavatories, ironically at Lincoln's Inn, where I was working at the time, <laughs> um, and, and, w and finished it in, in the loose at Lincoln's Inn, and wept, and came out and wrote about four A4 sides of a love letter, and saying, you're, like, you're here, I, I now have someone who had a religious upbringing, who lived in this world where religiosity had fabric, it, it wasn't just a sort of absurdity, it was in some sense real. And I didn't hear from her for about a year. And then just about when I'd got a, finally got a publishing contract with wonderful Serpent's Tale, um, I um, opened the letterbox in my flat in London and there was a small white envelope addressed to me in genuinely what looked like a quill. <laughs> and, and on the back was one of those little labels that you used to yeah. be able to get showing your address. And it had a black cat on it and it said Hilary Mantel and had her address in Budley Salterdon. And she had written me a card with a blackbird on it and and said, thank you for your letter, and, and my book had just been favourably reviewed in The Guardian. I've seen your reviews, you must be so happy, you must be oh. so proud. Congratulations. And from then on, we occasionally corresponded. So, sorry, that was Lovely. desperately sentimental. We liked it. Um, no, we, we liked it, and, you know, it, it's no surprise to me or anyone that, you, you know, it sometimes appears that Wolf Hall just... There it came. She'd been writing these other books, and then there was Wolf Hall. It seemed to me completely of a piece with Beyond Black. Yeah. Actually, it's no surprise that that was the novel that preceded it. That seemed to bring her yeah. into, into that space, and it was to do with those other lives, other worlds. Lydia, would you like to read to us? We'd like you to. Yes. Um, I'm just going to read from the paper. <clears throat> so this is from the book um, about adaptation an extract from the Reith Lectures. When fiction is turned into theater or into a film or TV, there's no necessary treason. Each way of telling, each medium for telling, draws a different potential from the original. Adaptation done well is not a secondary process, a set of grudging compromises, but an act of creation in itself. Indeed, the work of adaptation is happening every day. Without it, we couldn't understand the past at all. An event occurs once. Everything else is reiteration, a performance. When action is captured on film, it seems we have certainty about what happened. We can freeze the moment, repeat it. But in fact, reality has already been framed. What's out of shot is lost to us. In the very act of observing and recording, a gap has opened between the event and its transcription. Every night as you watch the news, you can see a story forming up. The repetitious gabble of the reporter on the spot is soon smoothed to a studio version. The unmediated account is edited into coherence. Cause and effect are demonstrated by the way we order our account. It gathers a subjective human dimension as it is analyzed, discussed. We shovel meaning into it. The raw event is now processed. It is adapted into history. Most of us spend our lives in adaptation, aware we have a secret self and aware that it won't do. <laughs> we send out a persona to represent us to deal for us in public. There are two of us, one home and one away, one original and one adapted. 
To adapt history for the stage, you must make time and space obey your laws. If you're working from a novel, that fiction becomes the canonical text, standing in for history. The novelist has some advantages. His stage sets are built out of black marks on white paper. On the page, a cast of 100 is as cheap as a cast of two. <laughs> for the stage, the adapter must reduce the personnel for practical as well as artistic reasons. Cut down the number of characters, and you must adapt the story, reorganize events so that one person stands in for another. But we owe it to our audience to stretch our technique to offer the truth in its multiple and layered forms. Not to mislead, because it is, on the face of it, the easier option. We should not avoid the complexities and contradictions of history any more than politicians should abandon debate, abandon debate and govern by slogans. We must try, by all the means we command, to do justice to the past in its nuance, intricacy, familiarity and strangeness. Historical fiction acts to make the past a shared imaginative resource. It is more than a proje project of preservation. It is a project against death. In the epigraph to my novel, The Giant O'Brien, I quoted the poet George Macbeth, and I leave you with this thought about what we want from the past and how we get it. All crib from skulls and bones who push the pen. Readers crave bodies. We're the resurrection men. <laughs> <laughs> sort of off piece question, Lydia, for you. You read at Hillary's memorial service, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. With the most extraordinary cast of people yeah. reading. I just wondered what that felt like in Southwark Cathedral. It was just the most extraordinary it, occasion, wasn't it? It was an extraordinary occasion. It was um, very moving, I think, for everyone there. And yeah, an honor to be asked to read along with uh, some wonderful writers reading as well. Mm, mm. Um, and a beautiful selection, Nicholas Pearson doing a more personal, not eulogy, but talking about his relationship, long relationship with Hillary. Mm. Uh, but the one I, the bit I read was from Royal Bodies, the, um, where she talks about the Queen and, well, Kate Middleton and, and the, the tabloids focused on, didn't they? And, uh, so it was very much in her voice. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it was a pleasure. Yeah, it was fun. And it was, it's just been such a pleasure, all of these events, just being nudged back to get, to get back mm. into Hillary's writing, because it's um, so brilliant. I just remembered Karen. a story. For, I went through all my emails from Hillary today, and I remember um, writing to her during the whole Kate Middleton sort of fuss, mm. and she said she was down in Devon, and that there'd been journalists camped outside her apartment for a week. <laughs> Um, all kind of furious, waiting for a quote. And she said that a neighbour had told her that some uh, lady had walked past and uh, one of the journalists had shouted out, are you Hillary? Are you Hillary? So they didn't even know who she was. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and so she was sort of um, explaining this with some wry satisfaction that she was in the middle of this circus. And said it was a nightmare, but what was brilliant was that she'd been having waves and waves of support. Yeah. And it was a fantastic... It was amazing to see her mentality at that time. We were working together when the controversy kicked up. And you would think any normal person would just go and lie low for a little bit. But she just came out fighting. Yeah, yeah and, absolutely. And really took everyone to task for their moronic reading mm. of what she'd written in the first place. She and was very, very yeah. cool, yeah. if that's the right word, with that perennial thing that writers have is no, but people reacting to something you absolutely have not written. Mm. I mean, yeah. it's enraging, right? Mm. But how did she remain so cool about it? Because she was right. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely and she correct. She knew she was right and she had that confidence mm. and mm. she was very benign about sharing that confidence around. Mm. Yeah. But I think that's the crucial thing, you know, is her confidence and that's what was so, a kind of comforting about her is that you always you never felt she, she was totally unflappable and she you know the way she involved you just what you, what you were saying about the family you know she just 
she, she really understood the nature of theatre, and that's what was clear in you know, the, 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 what you read, but she understood its kind of fibrility and its kind of its vagueness. You know, it's very unspecific. And, well, it, it, it's kind of not unspecific. It's kind of, it's ephemeral. Well, it's constantly moving. Yeah. And constantly changing. And, and that's why it worked so well with her writing. Yeah. Mm. And I think the temptation for um, novelists, as, as she gets close to saying in that thing that you just read so brilliantly, is to preserve that you feel like these, adap these adapters, the theatre, film, whatever, are going to come and change what you've created. But Hillary was always about the opportunity. Well, the game was slightly different, so she couldn't do a, a paragraph of beautifully crafted prose explaining where we were, but she understood that that, that information could be a transaction between two actors in a space. Mm -hmm. And it's so fun reading the um, emails from the start to, to finish because I could really see how confident she was in terms of talking about theatre as a form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a couple of years in, she was discussing in great detail the lighting yeah. and yeah. how some still piece of furniture on the stage actually might highlight the movement a little mm. bit more. Mm. You know, just really, really intricate. Mm. Better notes than you would get from an artistic director. Mm. What were those moments like when she was in the rehearsal space with you all? Um, terrific. I was just going to say, wh wh mm. when we transferred to Broadway, um, there was sort of there was some sort of tweaking going on with, with, with the script, and um, by this stage, you know, we've gone sort of completely mad anyway, just because um, <laughs> you know, it's such a long time. And bear with, but found myself in the now obviously ludicrous position of arguing with Hillary about because you, know, you get your you've mapped your sort of thought you, process. You were the authority on Anne Boleyn at um, that yeah. point. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you like, yeah. But so, you were. I don't mean that. <laughs> uh, but so there was a scene being added. Uh, that wasn't in the books, and I was for some reason uh, it was, it, yeah, bear with me, that was thinking saying, but why why that would that have helped? you know argument who and when she and I, a little to and fro, but she was obviously always kind and um, helpful. She said, I said, but how do you know it happened? And she went, because I saw it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. you can't <laughs> argue with that <laughs> argument over. But yeah. it, the other thing you're saying, saying about her physicality, but it's her voice. Her yeah. voice was in, it was like she was talking from another sphere, you know, another dimension. It was just you know, just listening to it again here. It, it was just when, on the first day of rehearsals, Wolf Hall. We all sat around the table, and we introduced ourselves. And the moment she started speaking, it was like. Wow, this is she is speaking from another world. It was very much that sense, wasn't it? From from you know the perspective where she talked about it as a novelist, and then of course um, all the work that she did with the adaptations and her involvement with them. She did regard it as the work of her lifetime, didn't she? I mean, I don't think that means she was breaking with her previous work, but she, I think she described it in an interview um, that she gave to me as just being able to suddenly do an enormous shout. And that moment of suddenly feeling she'd come into her own. I mean, how do you know that mm -hmm. as a novelist? How do you know that as a creator of any art form, I wonder? I remember her saying that she had willingly given up the vast majority of her friends and acquaintances for the sake of work. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I found that a really extraordinarily uh, courageous thing to say, perhaps especially for a woman who is expected to do a certain amount of social and emotional labour in the family. But to privilege her work above friendship was such an astounding thing to say. And I believed it, absolutely. And one of the amazing things about her was that she contained all these contradictions. And I, reading this, I kept thinking, that's not what you said <laughs> the last time I read on this subject. <laughs> and, and so she would say that, which is quite a brutal thing to say, quite a hard thing to yeah. say. And yet she was the most unfailingly kind and generous writer I've met, actually. Yeah. You know, unrelentingly supportive of up-and-coming, you, know, you, you know, new writers. So generous with her time and her correspondence. Um, and so she just sort of contained these impossible sets of contradictions because she was such a sort of complicated um, psyche in some ways. And I think that there is 
I feel this, and I'm sure all of us here do, that, the, that you're seized with a sense of the importance of a piece of work that's underway, where I know that I have sort of sacrificed health and, and all sorts of things for the sake of a book. And, and I think that that's necessary, and I think that that's okay. And I think the thing with Hillary is that she had authority, so the authority and the rigour and the toughness that you see in her prose, she felt about herself. Mm. So we might, I might feel ashamed if I would say I would genuinely rather like not see any of my friends ever again if it meant I could write a book like <laughs> Walpole. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say that, yeah. would I? Mm. Yeah. But she can say mm. that kind yeah. of thing because she knew her mind, like you mm. were saying so well, that it, I don't think it would have occurred to her that that could be seen as in some way cold yeah. or... Mm. As a company, how did that sort of transmit itself to you? What do you take from that when you think, okay, we are embarked on, you know, conveying in a different medium someone's life's work? Or do you just have to not think that? No, I mean, she made it very easy. So mm. the, 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 the terrifying, I don't think I've prob probably ever been as professionally terrified as the days between being offered the job or uh, you know, asked to talk, to think about the job and meeting Hillary. Mm. and that mm. being part of the process and I'd read the first one and I very quickly had to read the second one and just thought oh my god what am I going to say that is going to be in any way impressive enough to land me this thing that I really want to do what did you say I can't remember <laughs> I'm, I'm, god I mean I think I probably just got her talking and <laughs> it's it sort of continued from there but um she so she yeah, she, she picked you for she she, I think I was set up and then I yeah. had a meeting and then she didn't disapprove. Mm -hmm. and then we got you don't on. want to blow the blind we, date though there, do you? Yeah. You no. don't want to just No, no, really like, that's what I felt like yeah. I could mess it mm -hmm. up. Yeah. And uh, she was so authoritative in, in work, in her writing, that I wondered what she would be like um, socially. And actually she was incredibly generous and very, very naughty <laughs> and very mischievous and say um, just the thing that everybody was thinking but she would just give it the right phrase mm. and would I mean, would quite mercilessly naughty mm. sometimes. Yeah, but, but in the process, what, what I was going to go on to say was, instead of it being a question of, here's the writer and we've got to impress her, and we've got the energy is about not betraying what she's written, it was much more about that she was on, she was on the front row basically lapping it up. And you'll probably remember as well as I do, the, the way she sat, it felt like she sat on the edge of the seat Mm. Very with a very straight back, mm. drinking it all yeah. in, and yeah. just ready to laugh yeah. and smile, and just turn around and give a thumbs up, and mm. just be a very, very sort of present, uh, very generous presence, very ready to laugh. Yeah, and it made it, it made it much easier than some of our other colleagues who were reserved and judgmental. And she, Hillary mm. was there, and she was having a great time, and that just gave us great permission. Yeah, and gave and uh, was probably the easiest in terms of an actor, not so much for Jeremy, had to stage her, which was, was a huge feat. But in terms of having Hillary there, you know, it's not like you, there, there wasn't a series of choices one needed to make about the character. It was just all there in the book, mm. and so you just yeah lent into that. And she was so supportive. Yeah, we know from this book, and we're going to move on to talk a little bit about it. That she her interest was not confined to anything that was right in front of it. Could be anything whatsoever. She was for a time a film critic and of course she did everything in exemplary fashion. The <sighs> only thing that makes me sad about what you're going to read now, which is from her review of Fatal Attraction, is that we haven't time, and you will have to read it in the book, to, re uh, to read her opinions on Mickey Rourke, <laughs> which, I mean, if I were Mickey Rourke, I would not now get up would not do it for me. I mean, it would, I would not be able to act ever again. Um, she didn't think it was great, did she? <laughs> she didn't think it was great. Um, but she is very, very funny on Fatal Attraction, mm. not something we put together with Hilary Mantel, but we're going to hear now. Yeah. OK, great, yes. Mad, bad and dangerous, sorry, on Fatal Attraction. I originally published in The Spectator in 1988 during Hillary's tenure as film critic there. Adrian Lynn's film comes from the USA, trailing a reputation for changing lives, for making people behave themselves by giving them a nasty fright. <laughs> it is, though, a quite unremarkable film in most ways. 
with its B-movie conceits, cliché-strewn screenplay and derivative effects. If this changes lives, it can't take much. <laughs> Just roots that are deep in folk phobia. Instead of characters, there are three potent symbols, man, wife, other woman. Dan, Michael Douglas, is a New York lawyer. In his apartment reigns a sweet, rich, domestic disorder. A caramel toffee light coats the tooled bindings of law reports. An overweight yellow Labrador basks on a well-stuffed sofa against a handmade quilt. Dan's wife, Beth, is played by Anne Archer. And is she fragrant? You bet she is. <laughs> <laughs> they have a chubby little daughter, Ellen, redolent of baby powder and innocence. And like many lovable screen moppets, Ellen doesn't, does not ruin her reputation by opening her mouth too much. <laughs> but then, Mom and Ellen go away for the weekend to find the family a new house in upstate Tweezville, to take them out of the flesh pots. Too late. <laughs> Dan goes to a trendy book launch, I hope you like sushi, and meets Alex, <laughs> Glenn Close. Now, what more could Alex have done? She could have worn a T-shirt saying, Beryl the Peril. <laughs> she could have handed out cards stating that the nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. <laughs> but her appearance should be enough to warn him. Her fashionable photogenic face is made up of intersecting hatchet blades. She has a determined jaw. She has a head of immaculate pale blonde corkscrew curls, the kind of head achieved only at some cost in money and physical pain. And when, later, she rises from a bed after a night of passion, it does not resemble a white woolly mat, but it is as cleverly corkscrewed as ever. <laughs> it's clear that she's won the most important battle in her life, that with her hairdresser. <laughs> and that Mr <laughs> Douglas should look out for himself. <laughs> Mr Douglas's face is based upon looser principles entirely. <laughs> Meeting cute with Alex on a windy street he gets into trouble with his umbrella. Nothing is to be expected of a chap who has such poor control over his phallic symbols. <laughs> <laughs> the film has, you see, lots of dubious subliminal ads for Dr. Freud. <laughs> Soon they're back in Alex's apartment, getting down to it quite frantically. Curiously, their lovemaking is played for cheap laughs and features the kitchen sink. I'm sorry that I cannot be more explicit. <laughs> Alex breaks it to her partner. I'd like to see you again. Mr. Douglas looks like a hamster threatened by a tomahawk. <laughs> Later, we hear him on the phone lying to his wife. When Dan tries to give Alex the brush off in a humane manner, because he's a nice guy and her attempted suicide does detain him for some hours, she embarks on a campaign of persecution. Finding that she is pregnant, she rings his office, turns up at his home, threatens him with a knife, and worst of all, Ellen's pet rabbit is found bubbling on the stove. <laughs> Make no mistake, it is the other woman who has boiled the lovable Lagomorph. <laughs> the film's climax is bloody and, like the rest, derivative. The style is glossy and banal, with the air of an advertisement for some product which is never named, but we know what it is. The final sequence finds Dan and Beth safe in each other's arms, and the golden lighting gone up a notch. We're left with a family snapshot, basted in marmalade. The audience, who has tittered and shrieked throughout in a manner which would gratify the filmmakers, were unconvinced by this ending. They saw that Dan had got away with it, but, do you know, said one young girl on the way out, I don't think their relationship would ever be the same again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, the journalism that we see and the kind of occasional writing that we see, there's a lovely piece in this book, for example, about um, her husband Gerald's love of Biggles. I wasn't expecting to read that necessarily. It wasn't something that I'd come across before. But she wrote so wonderfully journalistically, didn't she? Because she was very interested in things. That's obviously, Lydia, in, and your delivery so underlined it, so funny. <laughs> but 
deeply mistrustful of the culture that is just served up to you with these kind of platitudes and things that are supposed to satisfy you. I've just said something there and I'm looking at you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, to we were just Who would like to respond yeah, yeah, first? Yeah. You said, of course, before when we were talking about, Jerry, uh, we are talking about um, you know, the storms that sometimes um, greeted some of her writing, yeah. that she, she knew she was right. And I guess that was the bottom line to a lot of this writing, wasn't it? There was some of the stuff I was reading, I was thinking about how that nothing was sacred to her, mm. which so sounds like I mean that she had no uh, kind of respect for anything. I don't mean that. I just mean that nothing wasn't ready to be dissected. Mm. And I was reading one of her essays about um, Sister Helen Prigine, the, the, the mm. anti-death row campaigner. And even that couldn't escape her intellect because she describes this kind of very desperately sad uh, situation with a, a, a black man, relevant, as she points out, long before people had the courage to, to write about um, sort of racial disparities and in, injustice in America at the time, I think. Um, and she talks about Sister Helen praying with this man and ensuring that he was at peace before the moment of his, his execution. And then she says, but she's greasing the wheels of capital punishment. Her, mm. her own part. And, and I, I remember sort of gasping while I read it, thinking even Sister Helen Prejean <laughs> will not escape that eye. Mm. And, she, and yeah. everything, everything, whether it was a review of Robocop or an essay on the death penalty, would have exactly the same pit benevolent, but essentially completely pitiless authority yeah. over it. Yeah. She wanted to get to the truth yeah. of, of things, didn't she? Um, I guess that was it. But, yeah. you know, and then suddenly very happy to write about perfume, yeah, yeah. which absolutely shocked me. Yeah, I was yeah. very glad. I thought, yes, she likes my perfume, that's good. But, you know, you wanted to be in her good books in yeah. a way. She's a, a writer who you wanted to have the kind of right opinions, although she'd really take issue with the whole idea of the right opinions. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely. I, I don't know if I should tell this anecdote. But, oh, you should. Um, yeah. Anything that, <laughs> that starts, when, I don't know if I should tell this. They, they were filming the TV version of this, when we were doing, can I tell the story? I don't know what the story is, okay. so, so please we'll take do. That as a yes. yeah. Okay, okay. So when we were not that story, we were. I don't know why I was asking you for approval, but I suppose that, um, I just I just wanted someone to condone it. So we were we were there, there was a bit of, there was a bit of rivalry between the stage version and the TV version, uh, and which was being filmed whilst we were in the West End, and Hillary had gone to, I think, the read-through. And Hilary was very protective over us because she was so involved with the creation of the stage adaptation and less so, I think, for the, the, the TV, but I mm. can't say without any, any authority. But she did go up to Mark Rylance on the, the read-through of the TV version. Can I say this? Yeah. And she said, she said, oh, Mark, that was brilliant. Um, if you need any, if you have any questions about, uh, uh, about Thomas Cromwell, just ask Ben Miles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, I need you now to just... Yeah. What could have been his face like, Mark Rylance? I, well, Mark was probably exactly, you know, Mark's impassive. face is pretty impassive. It's not you know. what you say to an actor. Like, yeah. I mean, it really is. Just, but went, Mark and she went on to have a, a very good a friendship. And a work Do you it, have so, to ask you? Yeah. I mean, He's is a, it... rose above that. I know <laughs> that things get made and remade, and, of course, you know... You know Actors are not the only person ever to have played X historical character. But it is quite weird when there are different versions. Did yeah. you? I mean, you kind of alluded to that, so I feel I can press you a little. Oh, George Berlin was much better on this, in the stage version, I think. I think, <laughs> I think, I think everyone agrees that. <laughs> I never saw the TV. I've never seen the really? TV version. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's, it's I don't very think I've good. seen the whole actually. I saw about 20 really? minutes no once in the happen. middle of the night with jet lag in, in a New York hotel, and that sort of completely confused me. It was like a weird dream. So I've never watched it. Mm. It is very, very different. Yeah. It's very different. But I think that we, you just, everyone takes ownership of their own thing, to their own involvement. I guess so. It becomes a different artistic form, really, you know. And it, it does get a bit competitive. I, I get competitive with it, but I did enjoy the TV version. She is very brilliant, isn't she? So I'm trying to find the bit, and of course I haven't quite found the bit, but, but on other writers. Um, and there is a whole section in this book that is her on other writers. And she seems, again, to get to the heart of, of matters. I mean, there's a wonderful essay on V.S. Naipaul, for example. Would you trusted her as a critic 
as a literary critic. Yeah, very much so. She very she writes on Rebecca West mm. really well, in yes. this book, which is just really gorgeous. And I think it's it's this strange. It's her. I think of it as her attention. It was so diligent and so intelligent that you would never get a kind of um, it, like a, f a fluff piece. Even somebody, a writer that she enormously admired, yes. she would still be quite dry about because she never saw herself as being anything other than kind of having the authority to speak on anything. Mm. Yes. So if it's Rebecca West or V.S. Naipaul or, 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 or whoever. And it's so when you say that, it sounds as if she would be very formidable in person, but that somehow wasn't the case. And so she managed to balance equally this extraordinary, I think, tenderness, particularly mm. for relatively mm. new writers, and, and almost a maternal instinct for them, which... You know, if you've read Giving Up the Ghost or her essays, you'll know that she was, uh, you know, her fertility was taken away from her effectively by force. Uh, in Confiscated. In Confiscated. The word she used was so striking. Yeah, and she, yeah. she said uh, that she is followed around by the footsteps of the children that she will never have. They're, they're like ghosts. And it feels to me as mm. if her kind of paternal or maternal, because I don't think it's especially motherly instinct, was turned on everybody with authority mm. and tenderness at the same time. Mm which is parental, right? Mm. So yeah. she wasn't just yeah. all, oh, aren't you wonderful, darling? You've done ever so well. And she also wasn't, you know, this this is not up to scratch. It was both at the same time. And, mm. you know, one of the best emails of my life was when um, I heard from my publicist, in fact, um, Hilary Mantel wants to email you about your book. Is that okay? <laughs> uh, yes. And she <laughs> praised... <laughs> praised one of my my books and it and it did feel like a kind of like a grace yeah, mm. yeah. i think that's very the maternal mm. aspect to her was very very present you know she was so generous with with all you know all of us and you i think each the what was striking about her at her memorial was that each of us in the company felt a particular they had a particular relationship with with Hillary, and you know, I went there thinking oh, I, I was her favourite, but then of course <laughs> it was a horrifying thing that everyone else thought the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember she was also very, very sort of no nonsense. And we're going to we're going to close in a minute, and we're going to close with a reading from from you, Oscar. Uh, but I remember I went to to Budley Salterton, which you're right is very funny. Uh, I always to... think he sounds like an out of work actor. <laughs> <laughs> With a cravat. Yeah. And, and possibly. Things have dried up since the 60s. Possibly some <laughs> empty bottles around, yeah, the, back, right, yeah, yeah. around the back of the sofa. I, I went um, to interview her just before the mirror and the light came out. And then I, I also spoke to her on the stage. And I said to her, in probably what was probably quite a sort of creepy way, good, you know, please think I'm good. I've, I'm so excited to be doing this, which she knew. Uh, and I've reread everything in preparation. And when I said, oh, and I'm also going to be talking to you on stage, she said, well, thank God you're going to get two bites at the cherry after all that work <laughs> and she honestly kind of minded yeah. she's like i hope you haven't done too much work that's like the woman with the most ferocious yeah. work ethic of anybody i've ever met mm -hmm. however Can i just say one more thing <laughs> you're just saying how people are sort of competitive about yeah. like, my who's who entry under hobbies is pointing out i was into hillary mantel first <laughs> <laughs> Unbear I'm unbearable. <laughs> well, we're, we're all unbearable, I suppose. <laughs> exactly what she thought, and she, yet she made us all bearable to one another, I, I guess. Um, uh, that was a, a, not a good segue. Um, Oscar, you are going to okay. finish off. We, we have talked of, of so much of what she's written, but she wrote so unflinchingly about the deep emotions at the heart of life, of pain and sorrow and yeah. loss. And this last section of the book really deals with some of those pieces. And you're going to read from that, yeah. Oscar. Eurydice. Mm. For some years, I lived in Africa, in Botswana. And people there used to say that to see ghosts, you need to look out of the corners of your eyes. If you turn a direct gaze on them, like Eurydice, Eurydice, you, they vanish. The whole process of creativity is like that. The writer doesn't know consciously what gods she invokes or what myths she is retelling. Orpheus is the figure of all artists, and Eurydice is his inspiration. She is what he goes into the dark to see. 
He is the conscious mind with its mastery of skill and craft, its faculty for ordering, selecting, making rational and persuasive. She is the subconscious mind, driven by disorder, fueled by obscure desires, brimming with promises that perhaps she won't keep, with promises of revelation, fantasies, fantasies of empowerment and knowledge. What she offers is fleeting, tenuous, hard to hold. She makes us stand on the brink of the unknown with her hand stretched out into the dark. Mostly, we just touch her fingertips and she vanishes. She is the dream that seems, that seems charged with meaning and vanishes as soon as we try to describe it. So as a writer, as an artist, your effects constantly elude you. You have a glimpse and an inspiration. You write a paragraph and you think that it's there, but when you read it back, it's not there. Though the climate of modern rationalism has a certain bracing and defiant appeal, we banish these gods at our peril. In times of great happiness or great sorrow, in triumph or catastrophe, we are not governed by rationality, and it is honest to admit it. The gods' nature is curled up within our own, and if we deny them, they come out to torment us with self-doubt and malignant sadness, and their breath is in the chilly wind we feel blowing out of the darkness. We see their bright faces in our love for our family and friends and country, and their dark faces in war and tribulation, in racism and hate crime. These gods are no role model for living. They have all the faults of the irrational. They are capricious, sometimes stupid. But if we deny them and repress them, it offers us no advantage. It's better to know their faces than not and hope that, like Orpheus, we can move from fate, from fate to pity. It's almost the definition of being human to want what is impossible. We want the 22 weeks gestation child to live and thrive. We want to live forever without infirmity and without the evidence of the destructive march of the years. We want to play games with time. We want, we want to undo death. We love the idea of the soul, but we are incurably addicted to the body and we want the dead back. Or at least we want a ghost to walk. But perhaps a ghost is not something dead, but something not yet born. Not something hidden, but something that we hope is about to be seen. We want to go into the underworld, back into the darkness of our own nature, to bring back some object of impossible beauty. We know it probably won't work, but what matters is we keep trying. The consolation lies in the attempt itself, the mercy that is granted to the hand that dares to reach out into the dark. And we'll say, well, I'm only human. I've gone to the brink. I've done all that I can. And as the last line in the opera tells us, those who sow in sorrow shall reap the harvest of grace. Way to end. Thank you so much, Jeremy Heron, Lydia Leonard, Oscar Pierce, Sarah Perry, and Hilary Mantel, of mm. course.